Well, God is good, amen? amen. I want to talk to you today about the aspects of communion, and I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into the base uh, of what communion is all about. How many of you know that sometimes, as I talked about with the youth, sometimes we can lower our standards? And I believe the enemy wants us to lower uh, our standards. When I was a little kid, uh, I can remember, have you ever seen one of those play school little basketball hoops, right? And so what we do for kids, we lower the standards so kids can obtain certain things. But we have to be careful that we don't lower certain standards in life because it can affect uh, different people. How many of you know uh, when, we, when we hang around people with high standards, we kind of raise our standards to them? If you're playing a sporting event and you're playing with a higher caliber of team, you, you will rise to the level, hopefully, to, to play in that. Uh, we see in our society, it's a consistent lowering of standards. So in, instead of raising our kids' standards in school because they can't meet them, because we're not doing a good, well, a good way in teaching, what do we do? We lower the standards. And so what happens is you can, you can lose respect. If you have kids at home and you're not having them keep a certain standard, uh, your kids won't respect you because you're not keeping a certain standard, and where they're, where they're having a certain standard, they'll be respected. For some people, that was a gang, because they have a higher standard than they had at home, and so they respect the gang more than they respect their parents. And so there's a certain standard that needs to be maintained, whether it's in our schools, whether it's in our households, or it's in the church. There are certain standards that, that need to be met. Here in the book of Malachi in the Old Testament, he's addressing certain standards of, of the sacrifice that takes place. And so look with me uh, on the screen here this morning to Malachi. We're going to look at chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, or you can turn to your Bibles. We didn't have enough room on the outline, so it's on the screen for you here today. And then I'm going to make sense of this for you. It says this, if then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest, that despise my name. And you say, wherein have we despised thy name? He goes on to say, you offer polluted bread upon my altars, and you say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? And now I pray you beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This has been your means Will he regard your persons, saith the Lord of hosts. So we see here in the text, uh, to make sense of this, the people in Malachi's day are complaining. Uh, they're complaining that God is not there. They're complaining that God cannot be found. They're complaining because God is not blessing them. Yet we're still coming to church, so to speak. We're still worshiping the Lord, but you, God, you're not blessing us. And the Lord speaks through the prophet, and he says, basically, the reason why you're not experiencing my blessing or presence is because you've lowered the standard. That's why you're not experiencing me, because I deserve much better. How many of you know that God is great? God is greater than his creation. Listen, you and I cannot come to the end of our galaxy, let alone come to the end of God. He has no ending. We can never come to the end of God because he has no ending, no beginning. He is just phenomenal. We'll spend many thousands of years experiencing how God goes on forever and ever and ever. And yet we live in our little finite brains and we don't a lot of times recognize the greatness of God. And so what we do is we can, if we're not careful, we can lower our standard. How many of you know 
there's always a bigger picture. When God is teaching us something in the Old Testament, listen, when God is teaching us something in the Old Testament, it's a framework for what God is doing in the New Testament. And so that's why it's kind of important we start here with Malachi. Then he says on your outline in verse 12, let's go to that. He says, but you profane it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and its fruit, its food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness and you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring the stolen, the lame, the sick, thus you bring an offering, should I accept this from your hand. So let me explain this, what the table of the Lord was during uh, Malachi's day, if you're Ital Italian, it's the prophet Malachi, but um, you see here, some of you will get that later, but the table, the table was the altar. If you look in the Old Testament, the table and the altar are interchangeable. The table, listen, is where they would take the animal, they would slit its throat, and it was gory, and it was gross, and it was probably kind of smelly, and it was an animal sacrifice there. And so they were complaining about this. They were complaining that, do we have to keep doing this? And you say how tiresome this is, that we have to do this sacrifice at the altar, and it's tiresome to us. And what they would do, they lowered the standard. Instead of getting a sacrifice that was without blemish, you know what they did? They got stolen animals, or they got sick animals, they got lame animals, they got diseased animals, and they would sacrifice them unto the Lord. And so they lowered the standard. So listen to this. They were complaining with something they should have been excited about. Now, let me explain this because here's where it gets really important. See, when sin entered the world, something happened. There was a great big divide between a holy, righteous God and a sinful humanity. See, listen, God is holy, right? God is righteous. And so the holiness of God cannot be in the presence of sin. And so here's where it gets very important. God could not have fellowship with sinful man because of sin. So God couldn't interact in a meaningful way because he doesn't lower his standard. Are you with me? So God is holy. He gave man an opportunity to obey or disobey. They disobeyed into sin. That sin separated a great big divide between holy, righteous God and sinful humanity. So again, God could not lower his standard and have a meaningful relationship with man, so God came up with a plan. So he could have a relationship with us and we can have a relationship with him. And the way he did this was by setting up, listen, an Old Testament sacrificial system. So the sacrificial system would create a substitute. Say substitute. Because sin could not be ignored. So God had to address sin, so he came up with a way to address it. It was a sacrificial substitute which would offer up an animal, and the death of the animal would serve as a temporary substitute to the divide of a holy God and a sinful humanity. So the reason why the sac uh, sacrificial substitute was so important was that it allowed God to bring the provisions of his covenant. Say covenant with me. So the covenant is important because the covenant allows us to be blessed by God. So in the Old Testament, they have something. The Old Testament is the translation for Old Covenant. The New Testament is a translation for New Covenant. So there is an Old Covenant, a framework to teach us of the New Covenant. Are you with me? 
And so it was very helpful. This is the way God designed it. So we see here it was allowed to bring the provision of blessing upon the people. So if you were to go to chapter 2 of Malachi, I don't have time to go there, but covenant is mentioned several times in chapter 2. So again, the covenant allows God to bless you. See, everybody wants to be blessed. How many of you want to be blessed? But not everybody wants to live under the covenant. Listen, when Adam and Eve sinned, they hid from God because of their shame. So you know what they did? They tried to cover themselves up with fig leaves. Wow. Yeah. But God, listen, God made them clothes out of what? Animal skins. Covered them with animal skins. Are you with me? So God developed a temporary payment. So on the day of atonement, the priest, the high priest on the day of atonement would do this. He would take a red bull and he would sacrifice it for his sins. And then he would get two male goats. <clears throat> One goat was the goat of purification, and they would sacrifice it. The other goat was called a scapegoat. Have you ever heard that word scapegoat before? They would take the scapegoat, and they would take it outside of the nation as symbolically the sins going off the nation and coming off of them. And so that was what took place on the Day of Atonement. So again, God developed a temporary payment. So on the Day of Atonement, we see that this would be done. So then God was able to then have a covenant with man and therefore be able to bless man. Are you with me? So this is very important stuff. So they had to go through this ritual if you will, to have a covenant relationship with God. So they are complaining because they have locusts, because they have calamity, because they have hardship. And in Malachi's day, they say, God, where are you? Why are you not blessing us? Why, God, are you not showing up? And they would say, the table of the Lord is despised. What they didn't understand if it wasn't for the table, if it wasn't for the table, if it wasn't for the sacrificial substitute, you would have no relationship with God. The contact with God was tied to the table. So when they despised the table, lowering the standards, listen, then the curse came upon them. Because without being blessed by the Lord, we have a curse, right? In Deuteronomy, he says, I give you this day a blessing and a curse. You get to choose. A blessing for those who trust and obey in the Lord and a curse for those who disobey, who don't trust. And so we see that. You're tied to something keeping the curse away. So the blessing can flow. You're tired of something you should be excited about. Because every time you do this, they're complaining, it's a dirty job, it's a smelly job. <laughs> but this is the way you're going to be delivered. This is the way you're going to be preserved. This is the way you're going to be healed. This is the way you're going to be freed. This is the way you're going to be blessed. So the substitute was the covenant. So if they knew what the table was about, they would have come excited to the table. Now we come to the New Testament, to the new uh, covenant. And look what it says on your first verse on the outline as we get started for the message. Don't be worried, I'll go through this quick. 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The cup of blessing, which was blessed, is not the communion of is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So he's talking about communion here. When you break bread, he's talking about the bread represents the flesh, the cup represents the blood. When you have flesh and blood, you have what? You have a body, right? So he's saying that we commune, that we have 
covenant relationship with him. The body and the blood is the whole person, so we're sharing, listen, when we come to the table, we're sharing in the life of Christ. Does that make sense? So with the flesh and blood, the bread and the cup, you're entering in to the life of Christ. In Malachi and here in Corinthians, both of them were tired of the same ritual because, listen, they lost sight of the meaning. Listen, you and I can come here and ritualistically come to the table and we can forget what it's all about. We can forget the depth of the meaning of what communion is all about. And that's why it is so important. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 21. This is an interesting verse. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Isn't that interesting? You know what that shows? There's two tables. <laughs> There's two tables. And so Paul is saying in Corinth, which, which was a very paganistic place, and they had their own feast, and they had their own rituals, and so what they were doing is on their Sabbath, they were going to the Lord's house, and they were coming to the Lord's table, but then the rest of the week, they were going to, to the devil's table. And how many of you know that's where a lot of problems take place? when we come to the devil's table. When you come to the table, it represents that you are eating, you are sharing part of life. And he says you can't share in the life of Christ and then somehow share in the life of demons. Demons want you to come with their table, you know why? So they can share their life with you. And a lot of people get in trouble in that way. Look what it says here in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 24. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he had given thanks. He broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you, do in remembrance of me. Again, he is sharing his life, where? At the table. So we go to the New Testament. Jesus is there. He's talking about communion. Where is he talking? Where is he? And he's standing there at the table. Isn't that interesting? The Old Testament, the table of sacrifice, Jesus is there describing the sacrifice. He's describing the substitutional system of sacrifice that was a temporary payment in the Old Testament that is going to be fulfilled at the table. Are you with me? And so we go full circle as we see Jesus is here at the table. He is sharing his life. Now, the aspects of communion is important. Number one, if you'd write this down, the aspect of obedience. The aspect of obedience. At the Lord's table, it's the aspect of obedience. It says this in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four: do this, whereas sin and the demon's table is representation of that of evil. And so some people, they eat at the table of good, and then they go and eat at the table of evil, right? And they wonder why, why the Lord is not blessing them, why they don't sense the presence of God, why things aren't going their way, because they've lowered the standard. God has a high standard. Look at Jesus. It's a high standard, and that's why that's why the Lord took offense to that, because Jesus is pure and holy and good and lovely and all these things, and yet they were sacrificing the sick, the lame, and the lazy, and the stolen to the Lord. And they wonder why they weren't under the blessing, but they were under a curse. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-five, 25, he says this, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new, say it with me, covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. So Jesus, again, is describing the New Testament. He's describing the new covenant that was taking place that he would fulfill it himself. In John 14, 15, he says this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
So he's talking about obedience here. If you love me, you will obey me. In John 14, 21, he says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. And he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So we see the first aspect of communion is obedience, that we freely come to the table, that we do what the Lord says. That's why it was important in the Old Testament. Again, it was building a framework for Jesus. Number two, the aspect of remembrance. The aspect of remembrance. How many of you know we can forget real easy? I think in a lot of ways, maybe it was designed this way, but it seems like during COVID, our standards kind of lowered a little bit, didn't they? It gave a lot of people an excuse not to come to church. And how many of you know, it was kind of hard to go to church during COVID, right? But we don't forsake the assembly together, and it's not to put guilt on anybody, but, but God deserves our very best, right? If Jesus was here, how many of you know you would make arrangements to get here? Let me tell you, Jesus is here. Amen. And so we lowered our standard by not coming to church, not doing communion, and using these little fancy things, which we probably won't use after we use them all, but um, because we didn't want to get cooties like the old ways we used to do it, right? And so, so the reason why I want to bring this up, because I want to reinstate the importance of what we do that we don't lower our standard, maybe it was designed to lower our standard in the church, but we're gonna rise up, amen? And so, in that, it's so important that we remember what the church in Malachi's day and what the church in Paul's day in Corinth, what they missed. We do this for a reason. We do this for remembrance. He says this in Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24, do this in remembrance of me, of Jesus. And then the aspect of self-examination. Let me tell you this. This is the way that it, it went by tradition. The high priest on the Day of Atonement would do the sacrifice, and he would go into the Holy of Holies to present the sacrifice. So there's a holy place and then a holy of holy place where the presence of God was. Now check this out. The, the high priest had to make sure he was right with the Lord. So he would do a sacrifice. Now, what they would do is they would tie a rope to the high priest and put a bell on him. You know why? Because if he wasn't just right, he would kill over dead and they would have to pull him out. You know why? Because there was a high standard. Again, there's a bigger picture at work here. There's a bigger picture. Let me tell you the bigger picture. The high priest had to be perfect. Who's a high priest? Jesus Christ. Jesus was a high priest. Now, the high priest's job during Malachi's day, during that time, was to be a go-between between between a holy God and sinful humanity. Jesus is our go-between. Between, he's that bridge. He's that go-between. He's the peace child between a holy God and sinful humanity. And so we see that Jesus is not only the sacrifice, but he's also the high priest. And so how many of you, if you were the high priest, you would make sure your life was right? Why? Because you are going to meet the presence of God. Wow. And God's presence <laughs> does not allow that sin. Whew. How many of you know that we take sometimes our relationship with the Lord and we lower our standard to such a low place. Hmm. God is worthy of our praise. In the book of Revelations, we will sing a song. Worthy is the Lamb. 
who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist sees Jesus coming along, and John stops in his tracks, and he points to Jesus. And he says, there is a Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That self-examination is important. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight. 28, the same text. He says, but a man must examine, say examine, himself, and in doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So what he's saying, we don't take it lightly because there is a deeper meaning than we know. It's a representation of everything in why we are blessed and why we are free, why we are healed. It has to do with the table. So he says we don't come to the table lightly because it's where Jesus, the high priest, was and where Jesus was sacrificed and is a representation of the flesh and blood and the life of Jesus Christ that we come into relationship with him. And so he says, you don't take it lightly. And then the aspect of confession. First hmm. John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many of you know confession is good? We lose some of that. But uh, how many of you know there's no one perfect in this room? The only one perfect was Jesus Christ. <laughs> and that's why he was able to fulfill the standard. That's why they did what they did with the high priest to show that there had to be a standard. You know what the standard was? The law. One day, you hear me say it all the time, I believe that everybody will be judged against the perfection of the law. The law is perfect in every way, yet it cannot save. But it is perfect. So what happens is, next to the law, we fail. That's why it shows us we need a substitute. That's why it shows us we need a savior. And so Jesus, the high priest, here it comes, he fulfilled everything in perfection of the law. He fulfilled the law and the prophets in his life. Hmm. And then the aspect of communion, you could put next to it unity. Unity. Communion. It's part of a union. Communion. It is the bridegroom, which is Jesus Christ, being united with the bride of Christ, which is us. The groom and the bride, which is us, comes together. Communion was instituted way back in Jewish culture. So when a Jewish young man wanted to be betrothed to a young lady, he would come and go to the father of the bride, and there would be a cup on the table, a cup of wine. And if the young lady was to receive the relationship, she would take the cup and she would drink of it. And it was symbolic of receiving the union that was about to take place. Then the young Jewish boy would go to his household to prepare a place for them. And if I go and prepare a place for you, see how that's symbolic? The bridegroom goes and prepares a place for them. The bride goes and she gets ready and prepares herself for the wedding. Here you are. We are here preparing ourselves for a wedding. And I tell you, the wedding's going to be pretty soon, I think. That's why we're called to be ready, amen? And so that's where that unity, that's where that intimacy of life that he's talking about, coming to the table in unity, in a intimacy, in a relationship. And then we have the aspect of Thanksgiving, number six, write that down. How many of you have ever heard communion referred to as the Eucharist? Anybody? The, the word Eucharist means the giving of thanks. And so that's the aspect of communion is that of Thanksgiving. We see in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four, and when he had 
given thanks. In Acts 27, 35, it says this. Having said this, he took the bread and gave thanks. And then the last one here this morning is the aspect of expectation. The aspect of expectation. Look what it says here in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, say it with me, until he Let's try that again. As often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. How many of you know the Lord is coming? The bridegroom is coming. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward here this morning. And uh, Peggy, can you put up the last verse found in Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 through 28. And it says this, and as they were eating... Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. You see how it all ties together, folks? It's very simple, but yet it is so profound, isn't it? That as we come to the table, that you and I would not despise it, but you and I might celebrate it. That you and I might be excited about it because of what it represents. It represents the blessing of God upon our lives. And how many of you want to receive the blessing of the Lord? Amen. And Lord, help us to live under your covenant of grace upon our lives. God is so good. God took it, he broke it, he blessed it, and he passed it out. He took it, he broke it, he blessed it, and he passed it out. He takes us, he breaks us, <laughs> he blesses us, and he passes us out. We are the body of Christ. We are blessed. We live under the blessing of the Lord God Almighty. Because of our high priest, because of the sacrifice, and we celebrate the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I thought it would be very apropos for us to reinstate something that is of great value that will be with us for eternity. Because of the table one day, <laughs> when we get to heaven, it says we're gonna be giddy like, we, like, like animals who have been kind of herded up and have been released, and they jump around and they hop around, and they're all excited and they're free. Folks, that's gonna be us. You may not be excited right now because some of you look like you've been baptized in lemon juice. <laughs> but let me tell you this, one day you're gonna understand the importance of what this is all about. And hopefully you can understand it now because I hope you can get excited about it when you come to church. Listen, you come to church to get aligned with the Lord. How many of you feel like you've been aligned today? Amen. And that's why we come every week to get aligned because the Lord's coming back soon. And my, my job is to help us get us all ready, right? Amen. And so we want to be ready. Would you get your portion with me and hold up the bread? We're going to pray over it. Uh, how many, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I want you guys to come to the table. We have been passing them out, but we're, we're going to go back to what we did before. So would you stand with me? And we're going to have the worship team, they're going to play. While they're playing this song, would you come up and grab your elements and uh, take them apart and get them ready, and we're going to receive it together. God bless you. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation, 
now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you Father, we come before you, Lord. We thank you for your body that was broken for us. Lord, we thank you for your blood was shed, that we can have a relationship with you. Lord, thank you that you were the scapegoat, <laughs> Lord, that our sins went upon you in death, that we might live eternally with you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be excited about this, because it means that we can spend eternity with you. Lord, we know for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, you did all the hard work. Lord, you had all a pain and suffering upon yourself. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be obedient to you. Lord, that you would help us to remember, Lord, to examine ourselves before you, 
If there's any wicked way in us, forgive us, Lord God. Help us to know that we have a union with you. Lord, that we are the bride of Christ. Lord, we come to you in thanksgiving for saving us. <laughs> Lord, for making a way for us. And with great expectation, Lord, we know that you are coming back for us. And so your word says as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of what you accomplished upon the cross at Calvary. And we receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and receive the bread and receive the cup. Let me again say this before the worship team closes. We are blessed. Amen. The curse was there. The curse was given to Adam and Eve because of their disobedience. The curse that they were living under is that Eve would be in intense pain, right, in childbirth. And Adam would be in intense pain because he had to till the soil and get out all the thorns. That was the curse. Listen, Jesus Christ fulfilled the curse that we might be blessed. Jesus experienced intense, intense pain, immense pain upon the cross. And then you know what they did? They took a crown of thorns and put them on his head. And Jesus took the curse that should have went upon us. He allowed the curse to come upon himself. That we can be saved. That we can be freed. That we can be healed. And it's all a representation of what we celebrated today. The table. Amen. God is good. Let's tell him we love him here today. Let's sing this song before we're dismissed. God bless you.